Let's move this guy out. <laughs> no, you don't need to. Do. <laughs> I don't have as many problems with Napoleon as some people online. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want in the background is fine with me. You can keep okay. it early and you put them aside, whatever. Send them to Elba. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. I am your host, Josh. You can call me Lando if you want. And today we are joined by Napoleonic expert and scholar Alexander Mikaparedze, Professor of History and Ruth Heron Noel Endowed Chair at Louisiana State University, Shreveport. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, we've, uh, we were just saying before we started recording, we've only actually spoken once before on Zach White's podcast. You'll please subscribe to that. He's a good friend of this channel. Um, so I'm delighted to talk to you today about some exciting upcoming work that you, uh, you're going to be gifting to us well you will be buying them but <laughs> thank you thank you so much um uh, it is a, a, a truly a treat to be on your uh show and um especially to discuss my own research um uh, as you've said as you've noted um i've been uh, busy uh, producing um, books on Napoleonic era and what i try to do is kind of fill in some of the gaps that exist in the current uh, historiography, and especially with regards to the um, the Russian involvement in, mm -hmm. in the Napoleonic War. So my new book, speaking of, yes, I have one of the uh, older ones, okay. and uh, or, uh, listeners and and watchers should be aware that you have translated an awful lot of really valuable um, first hand accounts of the Russian army in the Napoleonic Wars, and they're, they're good. these are gold basically, because up until, yeah. up until now, I, 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 yeah, there's nothing. I think so, <laughs> I think so. especially um, this, uh, this year, uh, we, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Phillips and I, we've worked together on, on translating and editing what will be probably one of the best memoirs of the Napoleonic Wars, at least. I think it is uh, mm -hmm. one of the best, and, but unfortunately not well known in, 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 mm -hmm. in, in the West. And it's memoirs of a of a Russian artillery officer. He wrote four massive volumes. Mm -hmm. So think of uh, kind of Marceline Marbeau <laughs> on the Russian side, wow. but with less inventions. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is the amazing thing. Actually, people don't get people are very aware of like the Peninsular War and all the guys who wrote uh, memoirs and stuff as soon as they got out of this war and service and everybody thinks that was just the British, but actually, no, the, uh, practically every Russian officer you can think of wrote memoirs as well. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that very much. So thank it's you for been, sharing. <laughs> what I find interesting about, uh, many of these memoirs is they are, um, so memoirs usually are written long after the fact, mm. but in, in this case, in many Russian officers cap contemporaneous notes, either journals or many of them kind of shorthanded um, uh, notes hmm. that they transformed it into memoir shortly after the end. So uh, Radzitsky, the, the person that I referred to, he uh, kept uh, campaign notes. There's another memoir that I'm, I'm hoping to bring into uh, to the English audience uh, by Nikolai Muravyov, who also kept shorthand memoir uh, sh notes and then wrote full uh, memoirs in starting in 1815. So as soon as the war is over, he's mm -hmm. uh, sitting down and writing. And uh, this is, I think, as in terms of memoirs, uh, this is as 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 good as it gets, right? Mm. Uh, next next level will be yeah. for them to keep the diary. <laughs> but yeah, I understand why they didn't. <laughs> wow! Yeah, that makes a lot. The, the, those guys had to, those guys had plans for after the war. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, but today. We'll have to come uh, do another show about the, the memoirs. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, your new book, which is uh, about someone people may have heard of. He's a little bit more familiar to a Western audience. It's a field marshal, and f correct me if I get his name wrong, uh, Mikhail Ilyaronovich Kutuzov. Very good. Yeah, no, you, you got it. Um... I, I have to note, though, that um, uh, Kutuzov is only uh, half of his actual uh, name. Uh, yeah. the, so he belongs to the Kutuzov family, uh, mm -hmm. and that's his, how he's known in the West. But his full name is Galinishev Kutuzov. 
right. uh, which is a cadet branch of the uh, of, uh, of Kutuzov family. Um, interesting, interesting. He is probably the most iconic uh, of the Russian commanders, and people envision him as this old kind of um, Tolstoyan figure with an mm -hmm. eye patch, right, sitting, yeah. brooding, <laughs> <laughs> sleeping. <Already> sleeping. <laughs> But uh, the and that's I think how I thought of him for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always thought that this was more of a uh, caricature than mm -hmm. the actual man. And uh, and mm -hmm. to, to a great um, to extent, that's what I discovered is mm -hmm. that the man is far more interesting uh, than the popular imagination. Aspect. Yeah, I, I I noted the reference in the title. You know, life in war and peace. So very very nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit um, on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure you get that in there. Yeah. Uh, that's good marketing. Um, so if you could characterize Kutuzov as you know him now, how would you do that? Um, so there is a side of him that I have great respect for and side that I really loathe it. Just like with this guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, we were talking that you know my office is full of Napoleonic memorabilia that students have given me. But it doesn't mean that I'm a big fan of him as such, because there are a lot of aspects of Napoleon's character that are very hard to stomach. And I think the same applies for Kutuzov. I love him uh, as a professional man, uh, and I think that will be one of the, I hope, one of the discoveries for the reader uh, is, uh, in, in, in the book would be how, what a consummate professional he was. He uh, studied as an engineer, he, he aspired to be artillery engineer, studied as an artilleryman, then served in the staff as a staff officer, was um, uh, tasked at various points of his career to equip uh, and train to equip and outfit uh, regular infantry regiments, uh, light infantry regiments. In fact, he writes uh, the first um, in-depth uh, Russian manual for uh, light infantry tactics and training. Uh, he was uh, tasked with uh, organizing light cavalry regiments. Uh, he commanded Pekinier regiments, uh, Grenadier regiments. I mean, it's it's in terms of sheer breadth of his experience within the military, it's hard to find, uh, as I argue in the book, hard to find other officer, not just Russian, but in any other army, who was involved in these diverse assignments. Uh, plus, he was also an accomplished diplomat. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, professionally, as a professional military man, he's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like a jack of all trades, where if, if, if you need things get done, you just call Mikhail and say, tell him, <laughs> okay, I need a new regiment. And he delivers it in, you know, several months later. Mm -hmm. But the side of his character that I find particularly difficult to stomach is, 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 is Kutuzov as a courtier, as, as a mm -hmm. nobleman navigating very skillfully but nonetheless uh, uh, quite immorally at times uh, this court politics and I think the most fa infamous incident that I think stains his career is when so he was an ambassador of Russia to the Ottoman Empire in, in 1790s and after returning back to St. Petersburg he discovers that Catherine the Great has a new lover uh, Platon Zubov, a rather young, dashing, and very arrogant uh, guy who had uh, this penchant for having people wait for him for for hours in the reception in the uh, re uh, reception mm -hmm. area, and then he would strut out s almost naked. Sometimes the well, contemporary said naked. He would just strut out. <laughs> 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 uh, remind people <laughs> <right? laughs> who is in charge. Well, Kutuzov would show up, show, up, show up in the morning and would stand there, psychophantly kind of, and brew coffee. You know, coffee being this kind of Ottoman, right, mm -hmm. experience. He would brew coffee and he would tell people, no one else can brew coffee as, uh, as I am. And he would just then serve this uh, upstart young uh, 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 dude in his, in his bed, right? And that part uh, robbed a lot of contemporaries wrong and it still robs me wrong to see this war hero mm -hmm. uh, this kind of mm -hmm. um, reducing himself to a reducing <laughs> <right? Yeah. laughs> <laughs> himself to being a servant with a, with a coffee in hand 
uh, uh, that, that part is, is, is awkward. Yeah. It's strange. It's very strange. I mean, it's a very strange story. But yes, it is very strange for a guy of his experience, a really uh, capable man, a tough man, got yeah. shot in the head twice, um, didn't die. And um, technically two and a half times, let me add. Mm-hmm. But afterwards, he gets uh, <laughs> grazed, <laughs> grazed <laughs> on the cheek. <laughs> he was a big man. <laughs> it's a big target yeah um, <laughs> uh but yeah uh yeah that's it's it's very interesting in terms of insight into what he was prepared to do to get along you know um that is very interesting he's not he's able to put his pride in a box yes and then Absolutely. do what needs to be done he does have a large family, so mm-hmm. um, you know he, he marries uh, um, in seventeen seventies and, and has six kids. Uh, and partly it is, of course, this concern for caring mm-hmm. for his family, and that's again the, one of the his good character mm-hmm. traits is that he is utterly committed to his family. And, and reading his letters, you you realize that he's kind of constant refrain. Mm. is this longing to be with his family, with his children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that psychophancy and that willingness to debase himself in order to get kind of mm-hmm. uh, uh, get along with, with whoever is in charge is partly because he understands how the power structures you know, kind of works in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a monarchical system based on privilege, and Kutuzov mm-hmm. is part and parcel of that system. So I, um, so it is maybe unfair of me to expect him to kind of stand up to it <laughs> yeah. and, and and show some. You know, I do want him to show some backbone. Kind of yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you also... <laughs> yeah. You want him. You want him to kind of be the. Yeah. Be, be Suvorov, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't serve the coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> Get your own coffee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At the very least, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, he did. Although he didn't get on very well with, um, at first at least, uh, Zar Alexander. So obviously, he wasn't serving the right sort of coffee. <laughs> yes, uh, with with Alexander, um, it's a interesting story of both sides being. And I'm putting it mildly lukewarm towards each other. Um, so th- there are a lot of myths surrounding Kutuzov, and especially this is true uh, for the Russian historiography, uh, where during uh, Soviet times, under the virtually direct orders of Stalin, um, a-, a myth developed around Kutuzov. Uh, and Stalin wanted to kind of recast himself in, in the way in in the wake of that uh, catastrophic Nazi invasion of 1941, uh, to recast himself as this savvy, prudent, hands-on commander, and what his argument was, and you see that kind of unfolding in the in the middle of the war, uh, when uh, they actually commissioning movies about Kutuzov while fighting Nazis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that the Nazis, the, you know, the argument that Stalin was using was that. Nazis did not surprise us. Nazis did not defeat us. They didn't destroy our armies. This was part of the plan. Mm. And how do we know it? Well, Kutuzov did it in 1812 to Napoleon. We're now doing it to the Nazis. And this narrative of Kutuzov as a uh, of this brilliant strategist who deliberately right crafted this policy mm. uh, was used to kind of prop up then the mm-hmm. Soviet own Soviet uh, government's own. Uh, actions during uh, World War II. But of course, then you have to, you know, it, it, it takes a, a life of its own and, and people then start to kind of exaggerate um, uh, mm. things about Kutuzov. And, and that applies to this relationship with Alexander. And so, so if you read the Soviet slash Russian historiography, uh, a lot of it is about making Alexander look evil and mm. uh, mistreating Kutuzov. But if you dig deeper, you see that the relationship is far more complex, where uh, Kutuzov, uh, Kutuzov's psychophancy, Kutuzov's willingness to debase himself, is actually what makes him unpalatable to Alexander in, in his yeah. young days. So when Emperor Paul was assassinated, Alexander and Kutuzov were sitting at that last dinner, uh, you know, with, oh. with Paul. And... Uh, and 
Kutuzov was actually a close figure to Paul. Uh, and we know that um, Alexander, uh, for the rest of his life, kind of struggled with the role that he played with his in his father's death. There's this wonderful quote from um, Adam Czartoryski, who, who says that his father's death hang around him like a vulture, like always hovering, mm. kind of that memory. And it, it, in part, I'm arguing that Kutuzov would have been that reminder because they mm. shared that last meal, right? And Kutuzov would have known mm. that Alex was, if, if, uh, at least tacitly, involved in conspiracy. Mm. And, and his father, will, you know, he's kind of shared that last meal with his father, like Judah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Uh, like, yeah, that would have been very difficult, I would imagine. Yeah, so that's a good point. That's a good point. And then when Alex comes to power, he brings a, a breath of fresh air by surrounding himself with young men, like the mm -hmm. unofficial committee. And that committee snickered at the old timers. Mm. One of them refers to Kutuzov as a relic of all times, and, mm. and that, I think he's right because Kutuzov's uh, mindset, his manners, his uh, values, I think, are reflective of an earlier era, mm -hmm. of maybe Elizabethan Catherinean era, mm. than of Alexander's era. This is young man's period, young, mm. you, know, and, yeah. and, you know, people who are willing. Uh, to embrace reforms and, and question some of the things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and because of that, it, it creates these tensions between the two men. Mm -hmm. And of course, Austerlitz only deepens those. Um, well, yes, I was going to, I was going to ask that there's a, in, well, first of all, I think that makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, a, a lot of the senior commanders in the Allied side up to this point were actually quite old men from who, you know, grew up in the 18th century, and they're much more used to that way of working and acting. And obviously, Kutuzov is a court general, he knew all the rules and everything like that. So you're not dealing with a Napoleon, who came through the revolution and stuff like that, a young man on the make, he's an established man. So that's, I, I, I he reminds me, you know, he's, he's Marshall Blucher's age, almost, by the end of his life. He's like, Two, those yeah. two figures are 18th century men, seven years war sort of time period. So that's always, I think, very interesting, uh, sorry, uh, important uh, to remember when you're thinking of where these people came from. But with, with people like Kutuzov, he, people talk a lot about his battles and um, you've already answered, so, you know, you've already said that you address some of the big questions in his life in the book. Um, have you managed to answer any of the questions about some of these battles like Austerlitz? Like, what was he actually doing at Austerlitz? And, you know, what about that backseat driving at Borodino? Mm -hmm. And um, the, or, or the aggressiveness at the Berezina? You know, it's, have you been able to get it behind any of these? Yeah, you have to, because these are the questions that go to the core of his legacy, right? Mm. Uh, why should we care about this man? Mm. Uh, um, and, and it goes to these fundamental moments of his life um, in, in Austerlitz, Borodino, to a lesser degree Berezina, but still yeah. uh, are the issues on which we should judge him. Um, and they are interesting because at Austerlitz, if Kutuzov was in charge, and, and I have to stress that he wasn't, if he was in charge, the campaign would have turned out completely differently. And I have no doubt that if given f uh, freedom to act, uh, Kutuzov's strategy would have brought about uh, an outcome that would have been diametrically op uh, opposite of the one we actually have. Because Kutuzov, in 1805, uh, he, he, uh, insists on a strategy that is protracted strategy, methodical strategy, a strategy of attrition rather than of confrontation. Um, we in and he does it consistently. He advises the Tsar to to not to fight the decisive battle. Now he is nominally the commander in chief of the Allied force in uh, Austria. Um, of course, there, as you know, the coalition armies. Uh, coalition had a lot, multiple armies operating, but Kutuzov uh, is the is the charge of the ar of the army uh, that was sent to Austria, and then the remnants of the Austrian army joined. That, or that force in the wake of Ulm. Uh, 
Well, when Kutuzov, ref so uh, in the wake of the Austrian destruction at Ulm, uh, Austrians expect him to take a stand and, and confront Napoleon, but Kutuzov refuses it. And he steadily retreats, as we all know, um, is willing to uh, kind of, side tr kind of uh, go around Vienna, um, which allows Napoleon to capture Vienna, uh, and then to regroup at Olmutz. Well, at Olmutz, both Emperor, uh, Emperor Francis of Austria and Emperor Alexander of Russia join him. And as soon as they arrive, of course, Kutuzov is sidelined uh, because uh, by the... Uh, by the statute of, uh, of the, by the Russian military statute, um, the emperor's presence means that he automatically serves as a commander in chief unless he delegates the authority. But even then, it's rather awkward uh, for any commander to make any decisions knowing that the august figure stands behind him. But in 1805, um, that arrangement is particularly uh, this, uh, important in that. When Alexander comes, he comes with that group of young officers surrounding him, all urging him to confront, to fight. We all know the story of uh, Peter Dolgorukov, right? That young, uh, ambitious, and rather arrogant man who meets Napoleon, and Napoleon plays him like a flute, um, right? Uh, convincing him of his weakness. Um, well, what is less known is when Dolgorukov comes back and tells czar that you know Napoleon is, is weak he's stretched his force is exhausted and we need to attack Kutuzov is the one who says no and he actually consistently insists through the last uh, two weeks of um, November that confronting Napoleon is not the the course of action the Allies should pursue he points out that if they wait three four weeks which it's not that hard would not have been hard hard to do that uh, they would have received Archduke Charles's uh, army, or, which was as large as the combined Russian-Austrian force, uh, which was coming from Italy and was passing through Hungarian plains. Mm -hmm. That if just wait, they would have uh, reinforcements from Russia coming, uh, uh, and the army that Napoleon would have confronted by the end of December, maybe January, would have been three times larger than his own force. That's where the campaign would have been completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, bear in mind that if they had waited, uh, 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 Prussians probably would have joined on the side of, of the coalition as well. Mm -hmm. So the dynamics, the strategic dynamic the situation would have been completely different. And yet he's repeatedly overruled by Alexander. So as far as Austerlitz is concerned, that is absolutely um, on the shoulders of Alex. In fact, um, when the campaign, kind of the Austerlitz campaign began and the coalition counterattacks, uh, even in the first, uh, those first two days of the campaign, Kutuzov still tries to convince the, the uh, Tsar not to push all the way to, to the battle. Okay. Then uh, you know, on December 1st, the, he goes and kind of has a meeting and, and again explains the disadvantages of fighting. And my favorite one is after all of this, after he's repeatedly overruled, um, of course, we have that infamous Council of War, right? Late December 1st, dawn of December 2nd, when Weyrother, right, the author of the, uh, of the plan, mm -hmm. reads the disposition. And Kutuzov by now knows that no matter what he uh, does, the battle will be fought. So that's why he kind of sits back and goes, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> Right, screw it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I do. I, I do love that uh, interpretation of it because you just hear he went to sleep. No, the reason yeah, why? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help that Beirut it has that mono, yeah. monotone <laughs> delivery, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've had it me, yes. I, I don't know. If, yeah, uh, if you are uh, familiar with an American uh, uh, movie where the teacher, you know. Uh, Recite Bueller, Bueller, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, <laughs> yeah. One of those monotone lecture kind of things. Uh, and Langeron, of course, talks about it that mm -hmm. they were looked at us as school, school children mm -hmm. uh, who should be taught and kind of explained in the basics of it. But what is interesting is that meeting start, ends around three o'clock in the morning, so December second. Uh, so the battle was supposed to start at around seven. So four hours before the battle. The council war ends, and Kutuzov makes the last-ditch effort to prevent it. 
he goes to he understand that Alex not gonna see him so he goes to the person who is close to Alexander one of the court officials wakes him up and he makes that last ditch effort to say we're gonna lose this battle that's what he tells him straight out you gotta talk to the Tsar it's not too late to not fight it right fall back regroup and that effort fails and more than this again to 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 kind of underscore the degree to which he was willing to 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 uh, uh, to try to avoid the <laughs> defeat uh, when the battle begins right and, and at around seven o'clock and these columns have to start shifting from the Pratsen Heights and try to uh, turn Napoleon's right flank Kutuzov's column uh, uh, that nominally was commanded by Austrian General Kolovrat it's it's still uh, it's it's a fourth column it's still on the top of Prats and it's supposed to move down but Kutuzov understands that by moving the column he's going to weaken the center and potentially open it to the counterattack which indeed would happen mm -hmm. so he waits there and as he waits Alex famously shows up with his posse and asks Kutuzov right why you're not sending troops uh, 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 as agreed on the flanking campaign, and Kutuzov looks at him and says, "I'm I'm waiting, sir." Right, <laughs> and then that waiting kind of was a hand that you don't do that kind of wonder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's really fascinating. That going back to what we're saying about him being a very highly professional, experienced 18th century general, you know, all the things he advises are sort of the best thoughts processes of, of the military sort of thinking of, 80, of the 18th century you know if you can collect irresistible force do it why waste the lives um, if you can avoid pitched battles do it why, why why risk everything like that there is one thing i do want to kind of uh, emphasize and in the book i try to emphasize that as well is that we oftentimes associate napoleon with new type of war that mm. emerged right and uh, Napoleon is brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you cannot but ad admire his uh, campaigns, uh, at least until mm. eighteen oh nine. But what I do want to point out is that he is not necessarily the only one. In fact, uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, failures of historians, uh, especially working in this period, is that we don't have good biographies of Russian commanders like Peter Rumensev. Mm -hmm. who, if you look at Romantsev's campaigns uh, in the Nubian principalities in 1770s, practices all the hallmarks of Napoleonic campaign. Mm. Moving separately, combining to secure, you know, achieve the superiority, even these notions of living off the land, this emphasis on fast movement, um, uh, uh, willingness to improvise, all is there. And Kutuzov commanded um, troops under Romantsev. Mm -hmm. So he went through that kind of school, mm -hmm. uh, and I think he would have recognized a lot of elements of what Napoleon was doing mm -hmm. uh, from the from the practice that he'd gone through with Romantsev. And I do want to point out that Kutuzov has a a, a healthy dose of respect for uh, for Napoleon. Mm -hmm. uh, he considers him, and this is a quote: "the the foremost captain of the age." Uh, he studied his campaigns, and what I find particularly interesting is that. When people around him in, in the Russian headquarters, or officers would criticize Napoleon, he would actually uh, right away snap and, and, and tell them uh, to, sh to uh, mm -hmm. shut up, essentially. Uh, and, and at one point, he tells an officer, right, how dare you to mm -hmm. criticize this man when you know, he is really a, a pro the mm -hmm. best commander of this period. Um, so I, I find that quite interesting, and, and especially knowing how Kutuzov approached confronting this general, mm. this supreme captain in 1812. Yes, I, that is a good point. And I think it's also useful to um, remember as well that uh, like Napoleon and people like, people like Napoleon and Wellington and, and people like that were all born still in the 18th century as well. It wasn't as if they were just sort of like completely doing new things. Napoleon, I think he, Napoleon writes in several places that his inspirations came from people like Turenne and um, Eugène. Maurice and, and Yeah, Frederick, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, it's I think it's that's another big misconception that he's sort of like doing stuff that nobody's ever seen before. It's more like he's just doing it better. Yes. <laughs> and then it's, it's a part of his mindset. It's part, but it, of course he does it advantages of the French military system that yeah. went through revolutionary period. So there are things that mm -hmm. of course uh, allow him to to do things better. But there is a limit to it. And I think the limit uh, is clearly seen in 1812 uh, mm -hmm. in, when Kutuzov uh, takes charge uh, of the army. Uh, and I want to right away kind of, uh, uh, you know, state that the strategy of retreat is not necessarily Kutuzov's invention. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think I can parts. hear, I think I can hear Jimmy Chen applauding right now. Exactly. Yeah, Jimmy, hi. <laughs> Yo, man, uh, another, another Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it certainly deserves all the credit for it. Uh, Barclay de Tolly um, uh, acted on the enormous strain, popular, you know, upon the political, military, all you know, strain. Uh, but I have to also point out that if we had Kutuzov from the very beginning uh, commanding the army, the strategy would have been the same. Because Kutuzov argued um, all throughout, throughout his campaign, throughout his military life, he's a very uh, prudent commander who is, uh, who is not going to risk confronting an enemy that is superior, uh, uh, on, on just, on, uh, uh, just giving the battle, as, as, as you pointed out. In fact, contemporaries um, in earlier years refers, referred to Kutuzov in this kind of jokingly, um, you, you mentioned his full name, Mikhail Ilarionovich, mm -hmm. right, that patronal. Well, they refer to him as Fabian Ilarionovich, mm -hmm. an echo of that uh, famous, right, Roman commander Fabian, yeah. who uh, uh, developed that strategy of attrition uh, uh, against Hannibal. Mm -hmm. So they knew, the contemporaries knew that Kutuzov's approach would not have been necessarily uh, uh, that much different from Barclay de Tolis. Uh, um, and what I find interesting in reading his letter is that when Kutuzov receives the command, he tells his friends, his family, that he is not going to necessarily defeat Napoleon right away, and which is an interesting admission to make, right? That here you have like a supreme commander in chief, and he says, "I'm not probably defeat Napoleon in the, in the first few weeks," but he says, "What I tr want to do is outsmart him." Mm. And that is an actual quote in uh, Abmanut, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of fool him, to outsmart him. And in those letters, when he talks about this kind of what he wants to do to outsmart Napoleon, uh, it, it becomes clear that he, he thinks more strategically mm. than even Napoleon. And that's where the battles like Borodino or the abandonment of Moscow are part of a larger uh, strategy um, to buy time for Russians, for the Russian army to regroup, uh, to put all the resources in, in place. And, and you, see, again, looking at his letters, I, I, I have no doubt that uh, Borodino is not the battle that Kutuzov intended, let me say, say it this way, intended to win decisively. Look, and looking at his arrangements, looking at his letters, you see this kind of rephrase, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, sentences uh, like, uh, I intend to let the French break their teeth at us, right? So mm. you don't say that uh, if you're willing <laughs> to kind of go and punch them, right, yeah. uh, and break their teeth. No, it's it's them coming and kind of trying to eat you up, but finding a flint, right, a flint stone rather than something. Nab and, you know, the fact that he digs in it, it certainly is an is, is indication that Kutuzov's, uh, the mm. battle that Kutuzov intends to fight, is defensive and he knows that the Russian army is well capable of holding the position and inflicting significant losses mm -hmm. on, on it. And, and the abandonment of Moscow is also to me is, is a crucial element in this because in one of the letters, and I find that letter particularly uh, revealing, Kutuzov writes about Napoleon's Grand Armée being like a torrent. Right? Mm -hmm. You've seen those landslides, this massive right, power, natural Right, that nature is worse, just swiping everything on it on its way down. And he looks Napoleon in that way, and that it is it is difficult, if possible at all, to contain Napoleon by that con conventional, mm -hmm. traditional means, simply con uh, uh, defeating him in battle. 
So he wants something else, and that something else is Moscow. And, and so he envisions Moscow as a, as a sponge that will soak um, this torrent in and keep it in, inside. And that is a very, I think, interesting insight into, the, um, into your opponent's thinking, um, anticipating that Napoleon, this brilliant commander that you have admired, you've studied his campaign, that he will not pursue the, uh, your, your army, but rather will content himself by taking this former imperial capital and then seeking political solution uh, at a time when you know you are not gonna, you know, he's not gonna get this political solution. In fact, and this is again one of the character kind of part of his that makes him such a complex and interesting figure. When Kutuzov received the uh, supreme command, um, Tsar Alexander told him that he should not negotiate under any circumstances with Napoleon. So, you have freedom of act to act, but do not engage in any negotiations. And yet, in October, we know Napoleon sends Lauriston uh, on this mission because he've tried twice to uh, send messages to Alexander to negotiate and uh, twice he received no, no response. So this time he sends the messenger to, uh, Nepo uh, to Kutuzov saying, hey, can you get to the Tsar? So even though Kutuzov has strict orders not to even meet the dude, right? <laughs> don't, don't even see the messenger. What he does is he brings Loriston in, he uh, um, sits down and has this long conversation with him, and then Loriston tells him Napoleon wants to send this peace offer, uh, you know, to diplomatic uh, uh, offering to uh, Tsar. And Kutuzov is like, sure, <laughs> sure, let me have the letter. I'm going to take care of it, yeah. And the reason, again, if you look at it uh, in his writing, is that he knows this is, this, is a, uh, this is a way for him to buy another two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. That he's going to keep Napoleon in Moscow for another, uh, you know, for ad additional time. And what is even more startling is when Tsar hears about it, he receives this letter, and Kutuzov actually writes in the letter that he attaches that this is just bullshit, right? Don't, don't, <laughs> don't pay attention to it. Alex actually writes back a, a very stern letter, chewing Kutuzov out <laughs> for meeting with Lur or Loristan. Guess what? A week later, <laughs> Napoleon sends another messenger, Bartholomew, and what Kutuzov does is like, yeah, <laughs> bring him in. <laughs> And he has this wonderful quote, and he says, in war, you don't miss an opportunity that presents yourself. Mm -hmm. And I love that kind of opportunism. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. that if Napoleon is willing to offer a negotiation, Kutuzov will milk it mm -hmm. to gain time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that approach, I think, is what uh, prevailed, mm -hmm. what, what defeats Napoleon. Yeah. I I agree. I think so. And it is, it is sort of brilliant that he's just sort of like, well, Russia's really big. It might take a while for me to get the messenger to the czar, but we'll get it there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll sort it yeah. out. <laughs> and and in, the, in the conversation he's having with the captured French um, officers, he tell, you know, he, they kind of sit down and they banter around and Kutuzov tells them that you guys had no chance that mm -hmm. uh, if you pushed after Moscow, I was willing, there is a, you know, a one conversation where he says, I'm, I was willing to retreat another 500 leagues mm -hmm. uh, east uh, in, you know, in order to, to wage this uh, war of attrition uh, against you. And, and, and that, I think, is, is a very important element to his conception of the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about, for example, his use of what he referred to as the Lille War, or, you know, this oh, yes, yes. asymmetrical mm -hmm. warfare that he conducted, and actively so, to the degree that he was willing to arm uh, serfs and peasants when the local nobles were actually expressing concern mm -hmm. about giving the populist weapons. Uh, but that's, again, a, a very, very complex individual. Yes, definitely. I also... Um... I have other questions to do with the book, but I also loved when I was looking at some of uh, Polish officers in Napoleon's army writing about the campaign, and the, just the, the 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 rising tone of sort of dubiosity that they have about what's going on, yeah. and apparently, like Prince Poniatowski at one point said, all of the south of Russia. It's right there. Give me a hundred thousand men, and I'll remount your cavalry. <laughs> uh, we should just sort of sit around for a little while here because we've gone as far as we can go. But yeah, it's yeah. Napoleon was being led by the nose, really, um, and it's and it shows. And and that's again knowing how brilliant he 
he could be and he was, that's, I think, what is startling is mm. that time and again, right, Napoleon does not do what we come to expect of him. Mm, I think and so. the traditional thing, the conventional thing that allows people like Kutuzov to anticipate it mm. and then uh, craft their own plans mm -hmm. in accordance with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I think to the degree that allies shot themselves in the foot in 1805, mm. Napoleon shoots himself in the foot in 1812. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think so. So, in, in writing this book, uh, were there any particular challenges that stand out to you, difficulties that uh, got in the way that you had to overcome? Uh, COVID. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's start with the COVID. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. That, that was, that was COVID a made a uh, travel uh, <laughs> uh, more difficult, of course. Um, yeah. So, uh, there are multiple er places where Kutuzov's legacy is preserved in Russian archives that are scattered around, but also in archives in Lithuania and, and elsewhere in, in Ukraine, because Kutuzov, uh, uh, in addition to being a military commander, was also governor uh, general of, of what is uh, today northern Ukraine, well, much of Ukraine, actually. He was mm -hmm. the governor general of Kiev, and then, of course, he was the governor general of, of Lithuania, but this is a much larger territory than, uh, well, used to be much larger territory mm -hmm. than it is today. Um, and so, accessing the documents um, in, in, in a time when travel is virtually non-existent was, was difficult. But I was uh, very fortunate, and I want, again, a shout out to the staff at these archives who were willing to work with me and, uh, uh, and help me do the research remotely. So that's one challenge. Mm -hmm. The second challenge is just the sheer, uh, I think it, it, it's just the sheer amount of material in it. You know, he was very prolific, Kutuzov was prolific, uh, leaving a lot of uh, letters, uh, especially on the, on the military side, reports. The, and, and the fact that he had a long career, 54 years, and diverse career meant that you had to go to wade through the minutia of kind of regimental management, management maintenance, divisional, governor, gubernatorial. But it also gives you a, a, I think, a, a flavor of the of what men like him. Again, mm -hmm. he is not in that sense. Uh, he's unusual in the diversity of career um, uh, path he pursued. But you know, think of Wellington or other generals who were also kind of engaged in multiple different levels of command, different directions, and, and kind of wading through this mountain of evidence. <laughs> is a challenge, but also exciting challenge, because mm. you, you realize what it took for them to achieve yeah. those heights, right? You, you, mm. and you cannot but re, you know, re, feel respect for them, for mm. their personal accomplishment. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I've never written a biography or anything like that, but to, in what I've done research into, like, the, it was the Marasha War, and I had to read the dispatches. That just gives you the Wellington's dispatches for those of you who don't know what I'm referring to. Um, just the daily amount of paperwork <laughs> that they had to do just 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 to get the keep the army functioning is, yeah. <laughs> is yeah. insane. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean it's just the ability to process this information. Yeah. Even if we say that they don't have to write all the piece of paper since they have clerks, but the ability to process this. Mm to be hammered by this onslaught of administrative yeah. right? <laughs> it's yeah. still to function. <laughs> I mean, I, here I am at university complaining about <laughs> yeah. committee work. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm complaining about like pr preparing for podcasts and writing it like, and it's like, let's get yeah. some, some perspective here. But um, was there anything actually that surprised you about Kutuzov? when you having written the book now looking back is there anything that's that you didn't know before that surprised you um i think uh, you can actually uh, you know you don't have to kind of go far if you look at my um, the russian officer core book i did uh, what, yeah. now, 17 years ago i have a biography of kutuzov in it it's short biography at the end i'm kind of criticize him critical of him and then if you look at the biography actual biography that i wrote now uh, i have much greater respect for his skills as a, as a military man. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, especially I have a chapter uh, in, in this book discussing his development of the light infantry. 
which um, is, is a new phenomenon, right, for, for Europe in the second half of the uh, 18th century. So French are experimenting with it, Prussians are experimenting with it, and uh, Russians are as well. And Kutuzov writes this first definitive manual, and I think reading it, you get a very uh, uh, good insight to his thinking, and, and both um, as a professional military man, but also as a, what I refer to as a to him as a military philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, this this notion of military enlightenment has been up and coming now in in, in historiography, and uh, your listeners can look at a writing of Christy Piquero on on the French military enlightenment, or Eugene Yakinkov on the Russian military enlightenment, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, as, as a broader kind of philosophical movement. Uh, but I, my approach was to look at Kutuzov as a military philosopher, as a person who is not looking at soldiers as automatons or as, as just fodder mm -hmm. to be bossed around and sense blindly. He really wants to understand what makes soldiers tick, how to make them better, uh, you know, uh, better soldiers. And so he tries to kind of go down on their level and his training is designed for that mm -hmm. and, and usually that's something that we uh, praise Su Suvorov uh, mm -hmm. right what we're doing but Kutuzov is is equal in you know, a less known for it but mm -hmm. no less uh, no less uh, I think uh, successful in, 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 in approaching soldiers as as living breathing, mm -hmm. thinking men that need to be... So, for example, give, just a quick, quick yeah. example. When he's training light infantry, uh, you know, these Jagger or, uh, troops, he wants people to understand how the ballistics work. So he sits in, in, in his manual, he says, uh, each all in officers needs to be standing to, next to each of these Jagger uh, and when they shoot at the moving targets. They actually has a special... Uh, training uh, um, exercise where they've set up these targets, silhouettes, and they shoot mm -hmm. at them. And then these officers, one, this person uh, fires, need to sit down and kind of analyze what went wrong. Uh, let's say, you know, why did bullet hit early, you know, you know this way or that way, and 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 kind of tangibly explain to the soldier how what is the best way to fix it. And that to me is very exciting to mm. see this. Um, willingness to spend time on individual level with the soldiers and say, "Hey, this is where you made a mistake. Let's see if you can fix it." Mm -hmm. uh, so that's again it's, yeah, it's, uh, fascinating. Yeah, I've, I've a, a very modern approach in that. Yes, it is very much so. And I mean, I think I think that a lot of people have this weird sort of opinion about how generals and officers tried to make armies work in the 18th and early 19th centuries to be honest there's a, there's a lot of bad myths out there about it yes. and the, one, the russians come in for some of the worst <laughs> right because this, there, there are people i won't name names uh, on twitter <laughs> right now going on about the russians have a slave army who don't think and are just used as cannon fodder and the officers are all idiots and caught caught buffoons and things like that and i i think that's a massive injustice to the like did not because it happens to the British army the Prussian army and everybody has these sort of opinions but especially for the Russian army so very little is known about it in the Napoleonic Wars except those things about the peasant soldiers the rigorous discipline and the the aristocratic officers and I, I, I think you're absolutely right is that there are always there are always problems in, in any military but those problems should not be used to generalize and, and obscure the complexity um, uh, of what was happening. Um, I, in my, with my own kind of uh, uh, teaching with students, I always emphasize that there are always extremes. You know, and like on the spectrum, you always have white and kind of black, but there is a lot in the middle that is mm. in grayscale. And that's where the really history comes alive. That's where the complexity is. Uh, so, yes, there were inept officers, but they were in every army. Yes, there were martinets who were insistent on strict discipline and punishing soldiers, but they were in every army. In fact, the very word martinet comes from French army, right? Mm. Um, but it's looking at the 
complexity and diversity of experience by examining people like Suvorov, like Kutuzov, or other reformers and uh, people who wanted to change the system, bring some exciting innovation. That's where I think uh, it, it is both more difficult but more rewarding task. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at least you know, with this book, I try to show that this general sense of the Russian army uh, it needs needs to be more nuanced. Yeah, uh, and, and, and we will get a better understanding of the period uh, by by yeah, looking okay. for details and com uh, and complexity rather than generality. Yes, uh, absolutely, one hundred percent agree. So, uh, when will this book come out? Uh, so far, we are set for July release date. Uh, it is a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, that should not be a surprise to anyone <laughs> <laughs> following my publications. Uh, some 800 pages of uh, sheer Kutuzovian epic. <laughs> that is that is worthy of the subject. <laughs> you said it's life in war and peace, but it's at least it's not as long as war and peace. <laughs> it's, it's war and peace. I mean, uh, I have up here uh, Rory Muir's volume one. Of one I have it right there. <laughs> so, so you're fine. You're fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I was relieved that he died in 1813. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unlike Wellington, who went on yeah. <laughs> to wow. achieve great things. <laughs> the, that, the, yeah, that, that I was feel like, I feel sorry for Rory. No, yeah. not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to, to wait through the, another 30 years of <laughs> what a relief. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and. You have an. I saw today that you have another book coming out this year as well. Uh, which... um, yes. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I. Uh, this is the book uh, that I was delighted that Osprey uh, uh, Publishing approached me. Uh, I'm a big fan of their campaign series, mm -hmm. uh, and to be uh, to be one of the contributors is, is truly an excitement, uh, an exciting time. And they, uh, I'm contributing a volume on on the Battle of Berezina. I explored that subject in my earlier book in 2010, but this, I think, will be uh, a, f a more concise and more, I think, accessible nar uh, narrative. Uh, mo the conclusions I'm, I'm drawing are still the you know, same as I did in 2010, but I think some of the arguments are, are sharpened here. And of course, Osprey does a wonderful job in mm -hmm. terms of uh, packaging it with with nice maps and illustrations. Yeah. One of these days, uh, I hope to join join the join uh, join you in being an Osprey author. For, have Fingers keep, crossed. I have to keep, <laughs> have, to keep uh, have to keep digging at them to publish more. What would, what would century. be the ideal topic for you to write on? Oh, that is a very good question. Actually, the first thing I pitched to them was one for their combat series, um, which was uh, Cossack versus Polish Ulan. Oh, nice. um, but apparently that was too niche. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I've seen, I've just, I mean, I'm looking at your, your book right now, you know, the Verzine 1812, and it just reinforces to me that there is no way on earth that Napoleon 1812 and Cossacks are not in, you know, of interest to people. <laughs> all right. So, but yeah, I, I'm, I would be more than happy to write on many subjects actually because i'm uh, i'm a notorious yeah. generalist um uh i i also i'm going to throw stuff at them on very wide-ranging subjects um most yeah, and I've, yeah i've talked to them th about possibly shifting the focus away from europe because it's mm. the series is as, as brilliant as it is is very eurocentric mm. and there are wonderful battles out there that need to be explored exactly uh, uh, so um, I think you know you've you've written your share on on Maratha uh, uh, wars, mm -hmm. but of course there are great battles mm -hmm. in the Indian subcontinent uh, yes. that need to be uh, better known in the West. Definitely, definitely. There's there are there are there are whole, yeah. I also yes, I also tried to to get them interested in some some Indian battles and mm -hmm. things again. They felt this was this was too niche. I, 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 I won't. I won't. I will. I will not let up. I will continue to badger them about it. I mean, I was a recent. I'm going on a podcast tomorrow as a guest, uh, the Lubbers Hole podcast, the Patrick O'Brien po podcast. Um, oh yes. Yeah. And I'm going to and uh, you know I'm talking about the Stanford Stanford Raffles and uh, expansion into Southeast Asia and obviously the conquest of Java. 
large, ba- fairly large, those 11,000 men landed on Java and fought three battles against the, the Dutch and the French. Mm-hmm. That's, oh, yeah. quite, that's absolutely. quite an interesting campaign. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. And in fact, a, a good example of the uh, sh- of the British brilliance in, in conducting amphibious mm. uh, warfare in the age of Napoleon. Absolutely. So I, I might, I left that out of my original list of ideas. I might try my luck with that again. Uh, uh, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, I do hope that, you know, the, that, their acceptance of Berezina is, a, is an indication of mm-hmm. the Osprey's interest in reviving the Napoleonic lineup. It has been uh, in, in the last few years kind of mm-hmm. lagging and uh, definitely uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted. And if you know anybody on in, Os- in Osprey that you, <laughs> if you know anybody, please do say that, <laughs> please do put in a good word for me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to bring me back on the podcast. <laughs> Alex, Alex, you can come back anytime you want, and I, I'll do a full series with you. I'll do like massive amounts of episodes. You see, I have a whole 19 video uh, uh, playlist with Jimmy Chen about 1812. So I'm sure we can do something. <laughs> no, you'll be back. You'll be back. If I, if I have anything at all to say about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh. Once, once, it. once you've appeared, you see, you can't yeah. get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be back at Hotel you. California principle, exactly. right? Once you check in. <laughs> yeah, I guess. No. Once, you, once you arrive in history land, you're fair game. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, this has been Alexander Mikhevaridze, and the book is Kutuzov, uh, Life and War and Peace. It's coming out this summer. Um, please look for look. Please subscribe to the channel to see the the, the next video that we do together. <laughs> Look forward uh, to it. And uh, please uh, find Alex on Twitter as well. I'll put everything in the description box that you need to find him and follow him and support his work. Uh, Alex, been an absolute pleasure. Uh, delighted to have you on the channel. And like I say, Thank you. Well, welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful yeah. day.